Hello, I'm Hayley and welcome to What's in the Night Sky for October 2020. October is a brilliant time to get outside and have a go at some astronomy. The nights are getting darker and there are some very exciting things for us to see this month. Our constellation of the month is Orion, to tie in with the Orionids meteor shower that's going to be peaking around the 21st. We have not one but two full moons to look out for and the highlight of the month has got to be the very much anticipated opposition of the planet Mars. Let's begin by taking a look at the moon. Here we are on the 1st of October and if we look towards the southeast at around 10 o'clock we can see the moon is visible and if we zoom in we can see that we have a full moon, the first of two full moons this month. And this particular full moon is known as the harvest moon because it is the full moon that occurs closest to the autumn equinox. If you'd like to have a go at picking out some features on the full moon, you could try and spot some ray craters. Usually we say that the full moon is not the best time to observe the moon because it can appear overwhelmingly bright and you don't get those wonderful exaggerated features due to shadows being cast along the terminator line. But one thing that is quite good to look at during a full moon is ray craters because the light overhead illuminates those rays really well and enables you to pick them out. One example is the Tycho Crater that we've talked about before. My mouse pointer is sitting there now and you can see these rays of ejected material that were thrown out of the crater when the impact happened um, that extend outwards onto the rest of the moon. Uh, another example of ray craters that you could have a go at are the Copernicus and Kepler craters over here. Uh, again, you can see those ray systems spreading out from the craters. And you can have a go at spotting those with your naked eye or with a pair of binoculars or a small telescope. If we stay with the moon and start to move through the month, we can do a little tour of the planets with the moon. If we go to the 2nd of October, you can see that the moon appears quite close to the planet Mars and if we go through the evening of the second you can see that that separation is closing and as we get into the very early morning of the 3rd of October you can see that the moon and Mars appear really close together and if we have a look at a binocular view they should fit really nicely into a pair of binoculars together and you'll be able to spot the orangey disk of Mars alongside the almost full moon. Moving away from Mars, if we go to the morning of the 14th, um, again early morning around 5 o'clock, then you should be able to spot the planet Venus alongside the moon. Again, really close together, should be able to pick them out uh, together in a pair of binoculars. Here we go, so we've got a thin, really thin crescent moon here and the planet Venus alongside. So that will be a nice one to have a go at with a pair of binoculars if you have some handy. Moving from the 14th now to the 22nd of the month. Uh, and we'll go back to the evening now. So away from the early morning, the evening of the 22nd and you can see that the moon is paying Jupiter a visit. So we've had a look at the moon and Mars, the moon and Venus, and now the moon and Jupiter, and also Saturn there as well. So uh, the moon, Jupiter and Saturn forming a, a nice triangle to um, have a go at spotting. And then on the 29th of the month, the moon is back to Mars again so if you missed out at the beginning of the month you can have a go at spotting the moon and Mars together on the 29th of the month um, and if we go a little bit later they'll be a little bit higher so a little bit easier to pick out and finally the 31st of the month brings us to our second full moon of the month which is something that doesn't occur very often and when it does occur it's often known as a blue moon so a second opportunity to view the full moon in October may be another chance to have a go at looking at some of those ray craters. If you would like to have a go at spotting the International Space Station this month there are a couple of opportunities to do so. Um, you can always look on the uh, Spot the Station website to find out when the ISS passes are uh, for your location. Um, 
this one I'm going to show you occurs on the first of the month at around three minutes past eight. Um, so you can see the ISS here um, has risen uh, around three minutes past eight. And if I just speed up, you'll see the path that it's going to take um, across the night sky. Um, so while you're out hunting down the harvest moon that occurs on the 1st of October, you can have a go at spotting the International Space Station as well. Um, and also at this time of the night, you have um, Jupiter and Saturn visible and um, the planet Mars will just be rising as well. So lots to see around eight o'clock on the 1st of the month. Let's take a look at Orion now. At the beginning of the month, Orion will be rising at around one in the morning. So you'll need to stay up a little bit late to be able to see it. But as the month goes on, it will rise earlier and earlier. By the end of the month, you should be able to see it shortly after 10 o'clock. And by the time we're getting into December, you'll be able to see it for most of the night. Um, Orion is one of the most well-known and spectacular constellations in the night sky. It's very recognisable. Um, and it depicts a hunter and if we put the artwork on we can see that um, so you can see here that um, the bright stars Betelgeuse and Bellatrix form the hunter's shoulders and you have the asterism of Orion's belt here and then hanging down from Orion's belt you have the sword um, and then at Orion's feet you have the bright star Rigel um, if we start by taking a look at Betelgeuse, let's just take the art off. Uh, so Betelgeuse is a red supergiant star and um, it's evolved very quickly due to its very high mass and it's expected to go supernova at some time in the next million years or so, which in astronomical terms that's quite soon. Um, and when it does it will be an incredible event to witness because it will shine brighter than the moon, uh, so bright that you'll be able to see it in the, the daytime. Um, if you are observing Orion, see if you can notice the ready uh, orange colour of Betelgeuse and you could compare that to um, the bluey white colour of Rigel. These two are the brightest stars in Orion uh, and actually two of the brightest stars in the night sky. Um, if you are able to explore Orion with a pair of binoculars, you might be able to spot that um, the three stars in Orion's sword, uh, actually one of them isn't a star at all. Uh, it's a nebula, uh, often uh, described as the great nebula in Orion. Um, and actually, if you're at a dark site, you may be able to spot that with your naked eye and it will look like a blurry star to the naked eye. Um, and then if you train your binoculars or your telescope on it, you'll see that actually um, it is indeed a nebula. Um, and it is the nearest large region of star formation to the solar system. Um, so when you're exploring Orion's nebula with your um, binoculars or telescope, you'll um, be able to see an area where stars are being born. One of the reasons I've chosen Orion as our constellation of the month for October is because the Orionids meteor shower um, occurs this month and it's one of the better meteor showers of the year to go out and try and um, have a look at. Uh, and there are actually um, a few meteor showers taking place in October so you um, have a good chance of spotting meteors throughout the month but um, the Orionids should be the best of all of those. Um, and the peak of the meteor shower is um, going to occur on the night of the 20th, morning of the 21st of October. So I'm going to take us to then. Uh, and you'll be able to see Orionid meteors throughout the month. So you don't need to go out and observe at the peak. But if you do, that is your best chance to see some of these uh, meteors. And we should be able to put the radiant on. And there you go. So you can see the radiant of the Orionids meteor shower occurs up here. And um, it has a, a theoretical peak rate of 20 to 25 meteors per hour, um, which means for us, we, if you're at a good dark location, you might be able to see 10 or so meteors per hour. Um, 
and those meteors come from debris left over by a comet and in this case it's Halley's Comet and every year when the earth passes through the debris stream of that comet bits of uh, the debris burn up in the atmosphere and we see those as meteors. Um, this year is a good year for observing this particular meteor shower because the crescent moon um, will set fairly early and um, won't be around to drown out the light from any meteors that you're trying to see. Um, my tips for observing meteor showers is find a, as dark a spot as you can, but um, if you can't and you just need to uh, observe in your garden, then you still have a good chance of seeing meteors, even if you are somewhere that's a bit light polluted and uh, you just won't see as many. Um, but a dark spot is better if you can. Let your eyes adapt, adapt to the dark, so um, spend about 20 minutes in the dark without looking at any bright sources of light so that your eyes are uh, more likely to be able to pick up the fainter meteors. Um, hot chocolates and snacks are optional but I find that uh, you can stay out a bit longer if you're a bit more comfortable. Um, so a comfortable chair or a blanket to lie on uh, is a good idea as well. Um, You'll know if it's an Orionid uh, meteor because it should appear to originate near Orion. Um, and while you're observing, there's no need to look directly at Orion. Um, in fact, it's probably better to look a little bit away from Orion. Um, you could try recording some of the meteors. And if you want to do that, get yourself a clipboard and a pencil and a piece of paper and um, sketch out the constellation of Orion and any neighbouring stars that you can see um, and then each time you see a meteor draw its path onto your sketch um, and then at the end of the night see if you can trace the, the paths of those meteors back to um, Orion to know that they were in fact Orionids. Let's finish by taking a look at what is sure to be a spectacular sight this month and that is the planet Mars. Mars is reaching opposition this month on the 13th of October. Opposition occurs when a planet is on the opposite side of the sky to the sun and appears at its brightest and largest for the current period of observation. The closest approach to Earth actually occurs on the 6th so let's take a look at it on the 6th. Of October and you can see that Mars is currently in the constellation of Pisces and if we zoom in and take a look at a telescopic view of the planet um, if you don't have a telescope then it's definitely worth getting out there and observing Mars anyway because it will appear uh, brighter than it usually appears and you should be able to try and make out that pinky red hue that the planet has as well and if you don't manage to observe around uh, the actual opposition the views of the planet will look great all month so anytime you can get out and observe Mars this month is going to be good Looking at the telescopic view of Mars, if you have a small telescope, then um, you may be able to make out some detail on the surface, uh, an aperture of at least 75 millimetres or above would be ideal to make out some features on the surface. If you have a pair of binoculars, you're not going to be able to see any surface detail, but you will be able to take a look at the disc and look at the colour of the planet as well. When you're looking at the planet Mars through a telescope, uh, and I should say that the, the fact that the planet is appearing to be larger is really advantageous if you're going to be looking at it through a telescope and this, although opposition of Mars occurs once every couple of years, this is going to be the largest that the disk of Mars is going to appear until the year 2033. So it's going to be a long wait before we get to see Mars looking this large again. So if you're looking at the planet through a telescope, spend a bit of time at the eyepiece getting acquainted with the planet. It can be quite hard to make out any detail to start with. It might appear a bit fuzzy at first. So you need to give your eyes a chance to get used to the view. 
the best thing to do in terms of magnification is to start low and work your way up and take into consideration the atmospheric conditions and the size of the aperture of your telescope and don't be tempted to go too high with magnification it's better to use a lower power eyepiece and have a clearer view than use a higher power eyepiece and have a, a poor view uh, if you look closely at the disc, you might notice that it's showing a gibbous phase, not quite full. And looking through the telescope, there's lots to see on the surface. I'm going to point out um, just three things that you might like to look out for. Uh, the first one is the su southern polar cap. Um, and the polar cap is appearing quite small at the moment because it is the southern hemisphere summer on Mars uh, so the polar cap is smaller than it would be in the winter. You may also spot some dark regions on the surface these are generally exposed rock and the lighter regions are desert areas. If you'd like to spot some specific features on the surface you could have a go at spotting Certis Major uh, which is this V-shaped dark um, area on the surface of Mars. And you could also have a go at spotting the Hellas Basin, which is this round, bright patch, which is actually one of the largest impact craters in the solar system. If you're looking for these features, you do need to bear in mind that, unlike the Moon, Mars doesn't just show us one face. It has a rotational period of 24.6 hours and that means that a feature that appears in the centre of the disk, the next day it's going to appear in the centre of the disk a bit later, about 40 minutes later. So um, if you want to know what is visible on the disk at the time you're going to be observing, you might like to use some uh, free planetarium software like Stellarium just so that you can have a look and see what will be visible. Um, Martian weather can make the features on the surface appear uh, brighter or darker or obscure them completely so you never know exactly quite what you're going to be able to see. If we think about the history of observing Mars, the first person to look at the planet Mars through a telescope was Galileo in 1610. And he wasn't able to see any detail on the disk, but as telescopes improved, astronomers were able to make out these dark and light areas on the surface that we've talked about. Um, and some of the astronomers thought that the areas were continents and seas, uh, making Mars a warm and a wet world like the Earth, similarly to how people thought that the dark areas on the moon might have been seas. And people wondered whether intelligent Martians were going about their lives on the surface. In the 1870s and 1880s, the Italian astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli produced sketches of Mars that had a number of straight features that were interpreted by some people as canals built by intelligent Martians to move beings and goods around on the surface. And it wasn't until the mariner flybys of Mars in the 1960s that the question of canals was finally put to rest. Um, and following the flyby missions, there have been a number of orbiter mis orbiting missions, landing missions, rovers such as the Curiosity rover. And we now know a huge amount about the planet, including the fact that liquid water once flowed on the surface, although not in canals built by extraterrestrials. And I wonder if Scaparelli could have imagined that in only 100 years after he was producing his sketches, we would know so much about the planet Mars. So that brings me to the end of our night sky tour for October. I hope that you have some clear skies and you manage to get out and view Mars this month while it's looking so brilliant and also the Orionid meteor shower is not to be missed as well. <laughs>